Well, good morning. Here's my title for the day. You want me to do what? That's my title. You want me to do what? I want you to imagine the scenario with me. You are, you are ready to go to a local church or to join a church staff. You want to lead that church or to join that staff. You've, you've paid the price of a seminary education. You've made it through here in three, four, five, six, seven years, however long it's taken you. And you are ready and you are pumped about ministry. So you pray, you talk to friends, you send out your resume, you go to sbc.net, you go to churchstaffing.com, you find out what's out there and you read about a church that grabs your attention. It's in a cosmopolitan center, so it's not in the country, supported widely by good transportation, significant businesses. That excites you. The population is growing. It's diverse, so there, there are people to be reached. The city is a religious melting pot, and so you can, you can invest in the lives of people from all kinds of faiths and lead them to Christ. You don't know a lot about the church, but you hear that the, the church planter and his team were some of the best, and so this church excites you, and you pray, Lord, let me go there. You're ready to tackle the challenge. This is, this is what you're made for. You're, you're convinced of that. So you get the opportunity. You get the privilege of meeting with the search team. And they do what very few search teams do, and that is they tell you the whole truth. They talk to you about reality. And here's what they say to you. We're divided. In fact, we, we divide at least among four lines. In fact, we don't even get along in this room. And we have some who should be leaders, but the truth is they're still babies, like that guy across the table there. There's immorality in our church, and people are bragging about it. Some, we have some members who are suing other members in our church. Some of us cause other people to stumble, and we're not doing anything about that. Sometimes we abuse the Lord's Supper, and you don't even want to know what's going on in our worship services. And there's some pretty serious arguing going on about spiritual gifts. I think I probably have the best. We're not even fully sure that there's a physical resurrection but hey, we are a great church and we want to grow. So we want you to come lead us. So what do you do? Do you run from any ministry possibility? Do you decide that God has now called you to plant a church? Do you decide to stay in seminary and get a PhD and teach what you don't want to do? Uh, Or do, you, or do you decide to go? What if, what if God calls you to such a place? And you want to say, you want me to do what? You recognize the church as the church at Corinth. Apostle Paul was instrumental in its Founding, He didn't face the, the, the tension of a pastoral call like I just described here, but in fact, he wrote letters to this congregation from a different city, and yet, and yet he wrestled with, how do I help a church in this kind of situation? How do I help a church when church is tough? And God calls us to do what we don't want to do. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want to give you some guidelines for what do you do when ministry is tough? What do you do when God calls you to do something and you simply want to say, you want me to do what? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I pick up in verse 1. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus 
called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you await for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray together, and then I want to unpack this text. Father, thank you, God, for this opportunity to come to this room to open your word. We again thank you today that we have all of your word in our language, in our hands. And we are grateful that we can open it freely We're ever mindful of our brothers and sisters around the world who can't do that. So I pray that you would speak to us from your word today. I pray for those in this room who find themselves in tough, tough ministry situations. Or those who might be wrestling with a sense of direction and calling and it's not what they thought would be the case. They wonder, God, you want me to do what? Thank you again for your word. Use me, God, to open it for your people. In Christ's name we pray, amen. What do you do when church is tough? Let's go back to the text, and here's the first point. Remember God's gracious calling. Remember God's gracious calling. Look with me at chapter 1, verse 1. Paul begins his letters, he begins so many of his letters with his name, a greeting, His calling, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. Paul. He's called by name. Remember the story. Saul. Saul, why do you why do you persecute me? Called by name. The the zealot for Judaism, the, the murderer of believers. This is the one that God called out. He is called, uniquely so, while on his way to Damascus to harm the believers, struck down by the light, told that he would bear the name of Jesus to the Gentiles and to kings and to the sons of Israel. And this is Paul, called, called to be an apostle, the text says, one who is sent, an ambassador, one who is commissioned and called to go out and to proclaim the the good news of Jesus. This is the one who goes and who writes under the authority of Jesus, a critical component of this letter and the next in in the New Testament. This is Paul, called to be an apostle, called by the will of God, the text says. Paul's calling is not, it's not his choice, Sure, we know he would, he would choose, he would make the choice to be obedient, he would make the choice to follow, but his first sense of calling was not, was not this inner compulsion first. It was, it was a touch from an external power that would strike him down and call him out. It was a dramatic encounter with God Almighty. This was not Paul's choice in the sense that he said this would be a great career direction. He would die in this task. This is not Paul's choice in the sense that he was uniquely worthy of this calling, and so he should do this. I remind you again, he had been arresting and killing the Christians. This this is not Paul's choice in, in the sense that he saw himself as obviously gifted, and he had a great education at the feet of Gamaliel, and he wrote good letters, so he ought to be doing this. He would save himself. I'm the, I'm the chief of sinners, and even for this church, he would not be there long term. All he would do is plant, and others would come behind him in water. Now, this calling on Paul's life was not of his own initiative. 
It didn't begin with him. His calling was of God, by God, from God, and about God, not about Paul. And he recognizes this is, this is the apostle captured by the sovereign will of God to do his work. Paul is neither worthy nor deserving of the calling. He's the murderer called to speak about eternal life. He's the sinner who will speak of grace. He's the enemy of God who would become the friend of God. He's the persecutor who would be the proclaimer. And it's not about him. In fact, keep your place in 1 Corinthians 1. Go back with me to the end of the book. Go back to chapter 15. He recognizes his state. Chapter 15, verse 9. And the first part of verse 10. Look at the text with me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to more was not in vain. Here's what Paul reminds us. We get to do what we do only because of the grace of God. He's an apostle because of God's gracious calling. And it is no different for any one of us. You and I do what we do because of God's gracious calling on us. Not a single one of us is worthy to do this. Right? If God calls you to the smallest church in the county and nobody but God seems to know that you are there, you are there under his gracious calling and his precious privilege. And if God calls you to the largest church in our country, it is not for a second because you are more gifted than the guy who goes to the small church. It is because of God's gracious calling and his privilege in your life. And if God sends you to the farthest reaches of our earth, it is not because you are more spiritual than the person who stays in North America. It's because of God's gracious calling and his privilege in your life. And if God calls you to minister to the president or to the prostitute, it is always and only because of his gracious calling on you. And even if God calls you to the mess of Corinth, and all you can say is, God, you want me to do what? Listen to me. You get to do that because of God's gracious calling in your life, and those people are his precious privilege to you. There will be days in ministry, any of us who have done this for like five minutes will say, there will be days in ministry when you will say, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. And you'll think there are surely easier things to do. And there are. And you'll think, I can just step aside from this. And then seemingly out of nowhere, the hand of God calls you back and you remember again his gracious calling. And though on one hand you want to say, I don't want to preach ever again, the fire in your bones begins to burn again and you will preach anyway because of God's gracious calling. And when it's tough, and you wonder, God, you really want me to do this? Remember, remember his calling on you. Here's number two. Remember his gracious calling. Number two, remember that our work is about God, 
not about us. Remember that our work is about God, not about us. How strongly Paul makes this point. Go back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's just walk through this text. Remember the church. Remember the rest of the book. Remember how messy they are as that search committee told you all the truths about them, or at least everything they wanted to tell you. These messed up people, and yet look at what Paul says about them. Verse 2, to the church of God. That is in Corinth. Now, they were messy, but they were still God's church. They're still the, the called out ones. Called out not just to gather as an assembly, but called out because they are the people of God. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. These are ones as messy as they are, they're still set apart. They're still set apart by their position in Christ. They are made holy by him. Called to be the saints together, continue reading in verse 2. Called to be the saints together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. They are saints by calling. Seems so strange to us when we read the, the rest of the book. They're not saints because they are worthy. They're hardly that. They're saints by calling because of the grace of God that overwhelms them. Because God makes them right with him and he puts them in the body of Christ that is much larger than they are. There are believers all over who call on the name of the Lord Jesus and the believers in Corinth get to be a part of that. And Paul reminds them, this is not about you. Even the church is bigger than you are. This is about this is about God. Paul says in verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been given grace by God, his unmerited favor, the peace that they can now have because they are in relationship again with their creator. Verse 4, Paul says, I give thanks to my God always for you. And I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. Because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. Verse 5, that in every way you were enriched to him in all speech and all knowledge. They've been enriched in everything. As goofy as they are, Paul says, you're gifted. And you've been uniquely gifted in speech and knowledge. And Keep reading. Verse 6. Even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking any spiritual gift. God has confirmed the message of Christ in them. They would hear the gospel and respond to that, and all of that would confirm the message of Christ. They didn't lack in any spiritual gift. They were uniquely blessed by God. And then we read in verse 7, so that you are not lacking any spiritual gift as you await the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says God will confirm you to the end. The day would come when even these Corinthians would be presented blameless. Not at all because they practically were, but because God had made them so. Because the story was never about them. It was about their God. In essence, Paul would say God is faithful. That we read in verse 9. God is faithful to his people. He calls us into fellowship with his son. And this God who starts it all is the God who will carry it on, is the God who will bring it to its end. Because from beginning to end, the story, the work, they are never about us. They are always, always, always about him. Paul reminds them of that. This story is not about the Corinthians. It's not even about Paul. It's God who did this. 
It's God who saved them. It's God who gifted them. It's God who put them in the church. It's God who gave them grace. It's God who gives them peace. It's God who will carry them through to the end. And even these messed up people, their story is about God. You see, here's what happens when we forget this and we think the work is about us rather than about God. We'll get angry and frustrated when things don't go our way because we think we deserve better. I didn't spend a lot of money and a lot of years in seminary for people to carry on like this. I didn't move my family so that some of these people don't always act Christian. We think it's about us. We make it about us. When we, when we make it about us and not about God, we will blame the believers rather than disciple them. And when we make the story about us, we never settle down and find peace in God's work. We never find joy when the ministry's tough. We're always looking for new grass. And when we forget that this story is about God and not about us, we fail to see the glory of God in the mess of the beauty of his church. The Corinthian church is messed up. And Paul said, you're still the church of God. And I thank God for you. I started pastoring full-time in 1981. If you've been in some of my classes, you know some of this story. 19 people in my first church, primarily two people who led the church, not I, two families that made up the church. So if one person got mad, they all got mad. Or if one family got mad, the whole family got mad. In those 19 people, I had two pianists, which was amazing to me, but one played with one finger very slowly. The other one played by ear, but only one hymn. And so that governed what we did every other week. Our treasurer had been the treasurer a long time before she ever figured out she wasn't scripturally baptized. One of my deacons could barely read. I promise you he made up words when we talked theology. It was not uncommon. I would get up to preach. I'd get ready to open my Bible, and somebody would stand up in the, in the worship center and say, Preacher, I got a song to sing today. And that was my signal to step out of the way because somebody was coming to sing, and not always will. It was at that church that I had a family invite me to lunch. He said, come on over. We're going to fix some fried chicken. I love fried chicken. I got there. They handed me a hatchet and said, go out in the backyard and cut the head off of that animal. I'd never done that. Uh, and I didn't do it very well that day, as a matter of fact. We discussed everything, we debated everything, we voted on everything, and some days those people drove me crazy. But you know what? I wish I could go back there again and gather them all in the room and say, thank you. Thank you, not because you were messy, but because you put up with me. Because in my arrogance, in my, in my thinking that their church was more about me as their young leader, their new pastor than it was about God. I failed to see God in the chaos that was that congregation. And I'm sure I missed something. 
I'm sure I missed something. When it's tough, remember God's gracious calling. Remember that the work is about God, not about us anyway. And then here's the third point. Remember to love God's people. Remember to love God's people. Let me show you this in the text. Get ready. Get your, get your phone ready. Get your hard copy ready. Go with me to chapter 1, verse 4. Let's just walk through this a little bit. Remember to love God's people. Here's what Paul says. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. Listen to him again. I give thanks to my God always. I'm forever grateful for you. You're divided, you're immoral, you're egotistical. You got bad theology at times. You don't even like each other. But I thank God for you always. His heart is filled with gratitude for these messy people who are still God's people. Let's let's go on. Go to chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1. Let me just show you how he addresses them. And I, when I came to you, brothers, and surely brothers and sisters, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Go to chapter 3, verse 1. It's the same kind of address. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as People of the flesh as infants in Christ. They should have been growing, but they weren't. And he still said, but you're still my brothers. You are my sisters. Chapter 4. Chapter 4. Look at verse 14. Verse 15. Who writes this word to them, and it's often a tough word, but he says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless gods in Christ, you do not have many fathers. I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I'm your father in the gospel. I introduced you to the truth. And you are my beloved children. And we read this and and we, we hear Paul paying the price of love as he grieves the wanderings of his spiritual children. He speaks as a father who lovingly corrects them. Go to chapter 13. You know the content of this chapter. Look at how it ends in chapter 13, verse 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And then go to chapter 16, the last chapter of the book. Pick up in verse 13. He's giving final instructions, and here's what Paul says. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, led All that you do be done in what? Love. Do it in love. Our task is to teach the people of God. It is to guide the people of God. It is to decide to disciple the people of God. It is to pray intentionally for the people of God. And everything we do, we're to do in love. Everything we do, we do because God first loved us, and we turn and give that love to the people of God. You see, here's what happens when you really learn to love even messed up people. You will look for the hand of God in their life. You'll look beyond the trouble to say, what is God doing there somewhere? You'll learn to listen to their story, and you might figure out, you know what, they act like they do because nobody anywhere has ever discipled them for five minutes. 
And the truth is, they really are still babies in Christ, even if they don't know it. But they are where they are, honestly, because somebody else let them down. When you really learn to love God's people, you will learn to be patient with them. You'll learn to trust God's work in their lives. You will watch for God's work in their life. And there will be times when you will confront them and you will learn how to confront them in love. So I'm not arguing against confrontation. That's much of what Paul's letters to these believers, that's what these letters are about. He speaks hard words. We don't even have everything that he speaks to them. And so he confronts them. He even grieves. I grieved for a little while, he says. But I'm glad I wrote a hard word to you because it brought you to repentance. You will need to confront, but you better do it in love. If I have a fear for your generation, it's that you will look at the churches that my generation started, and we didn't always build them well. You will recognize that we have all kinds of room for improvement, and you will set out to change churches that you don't love yet. And when you try to change a church that you don't love, you will run over the people of God in the process. And you'll hit walls of resistance, and you will turn around and blame the church and just declare them all unregenerate for not following you. When the greater problem may well be that you are not so loving unkind leader because you confronted without love. And when God says to you, I want you to go do this anyway, and you say, you want me to do what? You better do it in love. You have to remember your gracious calling. You have to remember it's not about you. And you have to remember to love the people of God. In fact, go with me to the end of the book, chapter 16, verse 24. Let's go to the end. Last words matter when you read these epistles. So you need to take note of these. Look at how he ends this letter. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. My love be with you all. It's amazing to me. He's chastised them. He's rebuked them. He's challenged them. He's laid them out. And here's how he ends. With a deeply intimate, personal closure. My love be with you all. So here's the outline of 1 Corinthians. I thank God for you always. I love you with all of my being. That's chapter 1. That's chapter 16. In between, you all are an absolute mess. <laughs> that's the letter. I thank God for you. In the ends, I love you. Tell me something. How would you sign the letter you write to your current church? How would you sign the letter you write to your pastor? How about the letter you write to the church where you grew up? Far too often we come to a seminary setting and we, we talk about good ecclesiology and do all the things that we need to do and then we turn around and we critique the churches that allowed us to come to be here in the first place and we see nothing but negative. How would you sign that letter? How would you sign the letter to the church that hurt you the most? It matters how you end. 
and it matters how you sign something. It matters how you sign the letter. I learned this the hard way. When I, when I became dean at Southern Seminary, over the Billy Graham School, I was in, in my boss's office. I was in Russ Moore's office, and Russ was seated at his desk. He was signing papers, signing, 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 signing. He looked at me and said, Chuck, get used to this. As a dean, you're going to sign your name a lot. And he was right. It seemed like every day I'd walk in, I'd have a stack of papers from my administrative assistant. I'd sign my name, Charles E. Lawless, Jr., Charles E. Lawless, Jr., Charles E. Lawless, Jr., every day. I didn't realize how often and how regularly I had been signing my name until our 15th wedding anniversary. My wife, by the way, is taking care of her family in Ohio this week. She gave me permission to tell this story, and it's probably best if she's not here when I tell it. Because I had prepared a card. I work hard to make sure I get something really, really sweet for Pam. So I spent a long time finding the right card. It said exactly what I wanted to say. I, I got it all ready. Decided I would put it somewhere. When she got up in the morning, she'd be surprised by it. And I couldn't wait for her to get this card because I knew this was going to be a good day. I was downstairs in our basement. Pam got up. I knew she got the card. And I heard this. Chuck, which, you know that tone when you know trouble's lurking? (laughs) Something's not right here. She said, did you sign your whole name to our anniversary card? (laughs) I said, no, there's no way. She said, come up here. I did. I opened the card. I loved the words. It was as sweet as can be, and right there it was. Happy anniversary. I love you very, very much. Charles E. Lawless, Jr. (laughs) You know what? It really doesn't matter how you sign your card. And it really does matter how you sign your letter to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. God calls you to a hard, hard place. You say, God, you want me to do what? Remember God's calling, his gracious calling. Remember, it's not about you anyway. It's about him, not about you. Remember to love God's people. And here's my prayer for you, that God will take you through ministry and God will give you a long life and you you can look back at the end of your life and you can still sign the letter to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear church, I love you very much. Let me pray. Father, give us love for your people. For those in this room who are hurting over the church, perhaps even for couples that are ready to walk away from it, God, change our hearts. Help us to say, I thank God for you, and I love you, but boy, you're a mess. Remind us that we're a mess too, saved by your grace. Thank you for loving us that we might love others. In Christ's name we pray, amen.